This is a story about one of the most controversial books ever written and the many attempts that have been made over the years to make sense of it. It was 1991 and author Brett Easton Ellis had just completed his new novel. It was to be published in March of that year by publishing house Simon & Schuster until they read it. Whatever. So shocking were the contents of the book that Simon & Schuster refused to publish it. Brett Easton Ellis was the first attempt at a public cancellation decades before cancel culture was an actual thing. No, I was just horrified by the descriptions of, of violence that were uh, contained in the book. And then on, on a, another level, as a feminist, I was very frightened by it because I think it sends a very dangerous message to people who read it. To have books like this published just reinforces how women are viewed by this society, which is subhuman. I don't want her to get second thoughts about finishing the urinal cake. Even though I marveled at her eating that thing, it also makes me sad. And suddenly I'm reminded that no matter how satisfying it was to see Evelyn eating something I and countless others had pissed on, in the end, the displeasure it caused her was at my expense. It's an anticlimax, a futile excuse to put up with her for three hours. And though the book was eventually published by Vintage Press, they actually forced Brett Easton Ellis to first sign a declaration saying he had read all of the death threats he had received. That way, if somebody did murder him, his parents couldn't sue the publisher. It's a novel that today still provokes controversy, but not necessarily because of chapters like Killing Child at Zoo or Tries to Cook and Eat Girl, but because of the many ways it's been reinterpreted over the years by different generations of audiences. If you are under the age of 18, do not read this book whatsoever. It is extremely graphic. Sex scenes, the killing scenes, they are all... Please take my word on this. The burning question everybody asks about this book and the film adaptation is this. Did Patrick Bateman, the yuppie serial killer, really commit any of the gruesome murders? This question, I'm here to tell you, is a bit of a red herring. Because Patrick Bateman isn't even the American psycho of the book's title. I'm going to tell you who is. Hey, Paul! Ah! First, let's take a look at two of the most pivotal and most debated scenes. Number one when Bateman confronts his lawyer to ask if he received his message where he confesses to his crimes. But that's simply not possible. Because I had dinner with Paul Allen twice in London. Just ten days ago. No, you... The fact that Bateman's lawyer, Karn, says he had dinner with one of Bateman's alleged victims twice in London proves absolutely nothing, since one of the major themes of the book and the film is the interchangeability of the characters. Everyone is getting everyone confused with everyone else. But it could be said to be highly coincidental that this particular victim is seen in London, the very place Bateman pretended Owen had left for. But the scene is important for another reason. It forces us to question everything Bateman has experienced and leaves him finally completely isolated. That's the ultimate tragedy for the Bateman figure, that by the end of the book, he is left alone inside his own head forever. The scene could be read as reinforcement of one of the major themes of the book, that a killer could get away with his crimes because nobody is really paying attention to what really matters. It's a theme running through all of Ellis's work. In Glamorama, he punctuates the action with a line from a song by U2. We'll slide down the surface of things. Earlier I told you that Patrick Bateman isn't even the real American psycho of the title, and it's an important point almost everybody has missed. Who is it? Well, the answer is found in American Psycho's most pivotal scene. When Bateman returns to the apartment where he has stored the corpses, he is confronted by a real estate agent named Mrs. Wolf. Alice has named her after Tom Wolf, the author of Bonfire of the Vanities, another seminal work about political and social life in the 1980s on Wall Street. This scene appears to confirm something, that the murders were not all simply a product of Bateman's imagination, that this prime piece of New York real estate has been cleaned and the crimes covered up in lieu of placing it on the market. But still there are some clues in the novel that Bateman has actually never even been to this apartment before. There never were any bodies stored in the closet. The building looks different to me as I step out of the taxi, though I can't figure out why. I still have the keys I stole from Owen the night I killed him, and I take them out now to open the lobby door. But they don't work, won't fit properly. Instead, a uniformed doorman who wasn't here six months ago opens it for me, excusing himself for taking so long. 
I stand there in the rain, confused, until he ushers me in. But focusing on this point is a distraction. If we focus on this, we miss the point of the scene. In the book, Ellis has named this chapter, crucially, the best city for business. Here's a theory from an academic paper I found called Escaping the Absurdity of Alienation, the Corporationist Form in American Psycho. Mrs. Wolf acts as a regulatory agent for the corporate form. This brings me on to who the title character actually is, the real American Psycho. It's this person, Mrs. Wolf, the real estate agent. The filmmaker Mary Hannon, who directed the adaptation of the book, is well aware of the significance of this scene between Bateman and Mrs. Wolf. The actor playing Mrs. Wolf has been perfectly cast, and the scene is paced deliberately. Mrs. Wolf is in this scene a formidable opponent. In the novel, he says, I am definitely not feeling right about any of this. Can I help you? I'm looking for Paul Allen's place. Doesn't he live here? No, he doesn't. Author Brett Easton Ellis has never publicly commented either way about the reality of American Psycho. He's been ambiguous when asked the question. You think the whole thing was in his head? You know what? Was it a dream? When I was <laughs> when I was working on it, the three years I was working on it, I didn't know. And it wasn't interesting to me to answer that. It was a much more interesting uh, book without that being answered. Nor has he talked in any great detail about this scene in particular. But in interviews, he has been forthcoming in explaining why he wrote the novel. He says, especially at this time, it was the heights of the Reagan era. It was the heights of yuppiedom. And I was just not happy about it. And that's where American Psycho stemmed from. But ultimately, I think I was too afraid to talk about how much that book was about me. Patrick Bateman is Alice's cipher to channel all of the rage he felt about the 1980s and the obsession with money and surface. It makes sense that ultimately, Patrick Bateman isn't even the villain of the piece, but simply a minor cog in what is a grotesque system. Mrs. Wolf represents that system. She holds Bateman's gaze, unflinching, poised, defiantly unintimidated. You saw the ad in the Times? No. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There was no ad in the Times. This is the cold indifference of corporate America, of an amoral capitalism. Clean up. Terrific. We'll make millions. Millions. Go. Quiet. Bateman's opponent, far more formidable than him, slinks back into the shadows where she exists as the regulatory agent. In American Psycho, A Reader's Guide, by Julian Murphitt, Julian says, Let us for a moment grant that Bateman does indeed, at least allegorically, kill Paul Owen and then uses apartment to torture and butcher two prostitutes. The full force of what takes place in this chapter can only take effect if at some level we believe it might all be true. Mrs. Wolf is the redeemer, humanizing the world of finance and an amoral type of capitalism, hiding the stench with roses. Mrs. Wolf watches me until I'm at the elevator door, pressing the button for the attendant. In the elevator, the smell of the roses is overpowering. Patrick Bateman, is unwelcome at the ritual of redemption. Don't come back. I won't. Don't worry. In the book, Bateman says that Mrs. Wolf is distressingly real looking, and this is important for two reasons. Mrs. Wolf is not simply something Bateman has imagined. The confrontation between the two is very real. Secondly, with Alice referencing Tom Wolf's book, Bonfire of the Vanities, he is letting us know that American Psycho, though of the same time and place, is a very different book. Bonfire of the Vanities is realism, whereas American Psycho is pure allegory. Patrick Bateman is simply not there. Do I feel calm?